Welcome to Landmark Baseball. I hope everyone had a good holiday. We took a week off for that, but we're back. We have a divisional breakdown today, so let's get into the rest of the NL East. If you were with us a few weeks ago, we did a Nationals breakdown, and I figured it'd just be a lot faster to break down five teams all at once, so we're just going to do all in a divisional breakdown like this. The Nationals finished fifth in the NL East, and then the Mets follow, finishing in fourth this year. They had a final record of 26-34 and 34 and did not make the playoffs. Their war leader was Jacob deGrom with a 2.5 war. Biggest surprise was Dom Smith, and they're losing Rick Purcello, Marcus Stroman, who they actually got back, that needs to be updated, Joanna Cespedes, and Jed Lowry. These aren't huge losses considering what the Mets have come up with in the last couple months. Purcello was a fading former Cy Young winner. Cespedes was one of the fringiest players you can have. Jed Lowry's been in the league seemingly forever, and he's been a solid player over his career. Teams seem to like him, but he is 36 years old, and they'll certainly be able to replace him, especially since he's only had like nine at-bats as a Met. As for DeGrom and Smith, I'll get into them a little bit later, so let's talk about the prospects. This is a pretty weak farm system. They rank 27th in the league. They could be pushing top 10 if they didn't deal with guys like Kelnick away, who's now the ninth prospect in all of baseball, but the top of the system's pretty solid with the top two prospects being teens. Ronnie Mauricio, he's number 57, Francisco Alvarez, 58. Both are still a few years away from contributing, but Mets fans should be excited on them depending on the franchise direction. Moving on, as per usual, the Mets had a Metsy type year. Weird things were happening. Robinson Cano recently tested positive for PEDs for the second time in his career, who was ironically the centerpiece of the Jared Kelnick deal. Try not to think about it, but he'll be ineligible for the 2021 campaign, which means the Mets don't have to pay a salary, so there's the positive spin to that. And then the Mets endured what was probably the weirdest event of the entire 2020 season. In short, Cespedes didn't come for the pregame routine, he wasn't answering his phone, he didn't tell anybody what he was doing, and then a couple hours later, his agent apparently came out and said, Cespedes has opted out of the 2020 season. The Mets PR made it look really bad. They're like, Cespedes is missing. We don't know where he is. It just could have been handled so much better, and it ended up he just wanted to opt out. Poorly handled all around, but one of the weirder events. But aside from rumors of the team getting sold in 2020, the team having the best OPS plus in all of baseball and finishing fourth in the division, injury after injury, underperformance after underperformance, there was a bright light at the end of the tunnel. Instead of rumors of J-Lo and Alex Rodriguez owning the team, Steve Cohen came in and bought the team. He set baseball Twitter on fire in his first week on there, tweeting things about free agency talks and what his plans were and interacting with fans. And Honestly, it's really great to see that. A lot of owners don't interact with fans hardly. They're not involved in their team. And while that's sometimes a good thing, it looks like it's going to work out for the best for Steve Cohen. He said, I'll leave baseball to the baseball people and I'll handle the stuff I can handle. Overall, this is a great change of pace for the Mets, who haven't really had a direction for a long time now. But the biggest takeaway here is that Steve Cohen just made the Mets the highest budget franchise in all of baseball. They're in the running for LeMayhew, Bauer, Springer, Real Muto, any of the big names, their name is just getting thrown around in it just because everyone knows that they have the money. But let's put a halt on those ambitions for a moment. Let's talk about what the Mets have as of right now. This is a breakdown of Brandon Nimmo and Michael Conforto's stats over the last couple seasons. Both are super underrated in the scope of the MLB, and they're really the centerpiece of this offense outside of Pete Alonso. As you can see there over the last two seasons, it's not the biggest sample size, but it's definitely their most recent performances, and they're quite impressive. OPS is over the 800 mark, 42 home runs for Conforto, 376 on base percentage for him, a 135 OPS plus. I mean, what more can you ask for out of him? And then Nimmo, who's caught the injury bug a few times, has put up similar numbers to Conforto, just over a less of a sample size. Both are 27 years old, and they're offensive stars who both make less than $10 million a year. You won't see a lot of kids wearing their jerseys at ball games, but they really deserve the recognition that they're not getting. Conforto was an all-star in 2017, but since then he's put up similar numbers and just hasn't gotten that recognition, so put some respect on their names. Nimmo is spelled with two M's in case you need to text your friend about how good Brandon Nimmo is and how he should recognize him as a good player. Then moving on to the opposite end of the spectrum, one of the most well-known guys in all of baseball, Jacob deGrom. And he makes a lot of people sad. Here's his career numbers. A 2.10 ERA. A 1.88 ERA+. A 2.31 fielding independent pitching. 
and two Cy Young awards. You don't need me or baseball reference to tell you how good he is. Just watch him pitch. He controls every single at bat. The pitches he throws are nasty. I mean, his slider is unhittable. His velocity is only rising. He was throwing in the hundreds more consistently this year than ever before. In a shortened season, he threw more 100-mile-an-hour pitches than any other season combined. Jacob deGrom starts are must-watch TV, and for good reason. He's only been to one postseason in 2015, and that was before any of his crazy reputation was with him. He pitched pretty good in the playoffs, but he's only thrown 25 innings, so if the Mets could get him there in the future, that would be great. Then, moving on, I move to my hardest-hitting question. Is Dominic Smith real? Dom Smith's been around the league a lot longer than people think. He's only 25 years old, but he was selected in 2013 out of high school. He just made his debut in 2017, and to be honest, his stats have been pretty lackluster. He was a highly touted prospect before he came up, but he hasn't really performed. In 50 games, he had a 169 OPS plus and a 316 batting average. His 936 OPS is equally impressive, and if they played a full 162 and he played the exact same way over the whole season, he would have finished with 138 RBIs. Obviously, that's not sustainable, but that should give you an idea of how much of a tear he was on. Compare this season to his previous seasons, and it's a whole different player. While I don't think he's going to bang out 140 RBI seasons every year, however, I do think that this is a different player than we've seen in previous years, and I think he's really ready to take the next step over a full season. Look at his peripherals. This tells me that he wasn't just getting lucky. It tells me that he was hitting the ball really hard and hitting it very often. But to quickly wrap up the Mets, I think they did not benefit from a 60-game season. Like I said earlier, they led the league in OPS Plus as a team, but they were plagued by injuries on the pitching staff, and they just really never got going. Under new ownership, though, I think they will sign one of the big names in the free agency board. About two weeks ago, they signed James McCann, so I don't think they're in on the real Mudo sweepstakes, which means they're probably going to land one of the other big names like Bauer or Springer. If this Mets team is healthy and they add more talent to this team, the sky's the limit, really. They can make the playoffs in a normal format. They have plenty of starting pitching, which comes at a premium come playoff time, so they're in good shape there. The offense is certainly capable. So be watching the Mets closely in free agent talks. You're probably going to see the Mets in the NLDS, if not farther. You may be thinking, how does a team that just finished in fourth place make the playoffs after adding just a couple names? Well, that's the Steve Cohen effect, and that's really the impact that an owner who has a lot of money and is willing to spend it on his baseball team, can have on a whole team. Moving on to the Phillies, who finished third in the NL East. They had a final record of 28-32. and 32. Their war leader was Zach Wheeler, who recently signed with them last offseason. The 2.9 war, certainly the biggest surprise. Significant losses include Rio Mudo, Didi Gregorius, and Jay Bruce. Obviously, Rio Mudo being the big one. And if you're a Phillies fan who's been paying attention the last few weeks, it's a pretty dire situation in Philadelphia. I mean, in the matter of, like, two weeks, it was complete chaos. They didn't have a GM. Their owner was coming out saying, we don't have any money. We have to move everybody. Wheeler was in trade rumors. Harper was even thrown around by, I think that was a fan thing, but still. And then they hired Dave Dombrowski as head of baseball ops, and then Sam Fold just got hired as the GM. And I really like that signing. But, I mean, two weeks of just absolute chaos. Going into their farm system, they were ranked 19th in baseball. Uh, they graduated Alec Bohm from that list this year. He lost his rookie status after a stellar season. Uh, Spencer Howard is the 28th prospect in all of baseball. Got in some innings, but was shaky. Nothing of concern, though. But I think the most interesting prospect, and that's not even on this list, is Mickey Moniak. He was the first overall pick in 2016 in a draft that included the likes of Pete Alonzo, Shane Bieber, and Kyle Lewis. Obviously, we can say all this looking back, but they weren't the highest touted draft picks at the time. But still, you usually hear a lot about first overall picks, and he's only four years removed from being a high school selection, but since getting to professional ball, his stock has just dropped and dropped and dropped, and he, he's not playing terribly, he's just not what they expected. But in 2020, he was able to get a few games at the major league level, and he didn't look bad. Not enough of a sample to really judge on, but... Maybe I'm weird, but I'm just going to keep an eye on him. I think it's very interesting because of just how fast he seemed to drop off. But to get into some of the bigger storylines of 2020, it was kind of a weird year for the Phillies. They went out and signed Zach Wheeler last offseason after signing Harper the previous season, and they got Real Muto in a trade. 
not long before that, so their core was there. They got DD last off season too. Oh, and Andrew McCutcheon on top of that. They had a really solid core going into this year, and it just didn't really happen. They had zero bullpen. It was historically one of the worst bullpens of all time. I don't know what it was, if the team just lacked identity or if the bullpen really did that much damage to them. The starting rotation was fine. The offense was pretty fine. They were on track to, like, miss the playoffs, and Bryce Harper was like, yeah, we got to win the next 11 in a row or else our season's done. They actually went out and won, like, the next 11 in a row, and then after that it dropped off and they missed the playoffs on the last day of the season. And for a team that just made all these signings and trades for win-now mode, and they can't even make the playoffs in a format where eight teams make the playoffs from their league. I don't really know the direction of the franchise going forward. We'll see what Sam Fold and Dombrowski do, but it's a little concerning. And on top of this disappointment and mediocrity, they're losing the best catcher in baseball from their lineup. And JT Riomuto, I mean, look at his baseball reference page. He has some insane numbers, and if they don't have money, they can't re-sign him, and he's going to be pretty expensive as is, and losing that from the lineup is absolutely detrimental to a team that shot itself in the foot in 2020. Here's some of the team stats. As a team on offense, they had a 342 on base percentage, good for third in all of baseball. And usually when you have a good average, you're not going to strike out very much. They only had 480 Ks, 24th in baseball. They were 8th in stolen bases. They scored a lot of runs, going for 5th in the league. And they left a lot of men on base, which was probably the reason that they didn't make the playoffs. 5th most men left on base in all of baseball. But I look at this offense, I think this is sustainable and that this is a playoff caliber lineup. Maybe without Rio Muto, it's not anymore, but this is a, certainly a capable lineup that can get them through a playoff series, no problem. Then there's the Horrors, that was the pitching staff. 26 highest ERA, 26 highest ERA plus, 10 hits per 9 innings, only one team was worse. They gave up the third most hits in baseball, 550, and most of this is on the bullpen. The starters were pretty good, actually above average. Then I want to talk about Bryce Harper. I've never been much of a fan of Bryce Harper. Kind of thought he was overrated, and I thought I had good reason, but since coming to the Phillies, he's been the same player he was on the Nationals, who was also a very good player. Doesn't really deserve the criticism he gets in terms of his performance, at least. While he's no longer on pace with Mike Trout like he was in the early days of his career, Bryce Harper is a plus-plus player, easily top 10 in baseball, and the cornerstone of this franchise. But as I said earlier, the direction on the Phillies is kind of hard to get a read on. The owner came out and said they don't have money, but that could mean anything. They could just be trying to manipulate the market. They might not actually have money. We'll see what happens with their offseason. But I think the Phillies are in a do-or-die year, where if things go well, maybe they sign a big name this offseason with the money that they may or may not have. We're probably talking about this a little differently. If they don't have that money, it's time to tear down. But they just committed to Bryce Harper for like 11 years or something like that. You need to make that trade if you don't have money so you can actually rebuild the franchise. But we'll see. Dave Dombrowski's a very good baseball mind. He does like to spend money. Don't know how that's going to work if they don't have money. But Sam Fold, also a big baseball mind. I think he's going to make a lot of good decisions for them. Phillies fans are probably on the edge of their seat, and I'm sorry, but this is the situation you've been dealt. Go Phillies! Up next, finishing second in the NL East, is the Miami Marlins. They had a record of 31-20... and 20... Oh, my bad. It's not better, but it's accurate. Sorry. They had a record of 31-29. and 29. The war leader was Brian Anderson with a 1.7 war. Biggest surprise was the starting rotation, led by the youngsters, and their losses are nothing significant. This was a team that wasn't expected to do that good anyway in 2020, but they ended up lucking their way into the playoffs. And yes, I will stand by that as being luck. This is not a great Marlins team. They just benefited from the 60-game format. But to their credit, they did eliminate the Cubs in the wildcard series. So even though they had a great 2020, I'm still going to call them a rebuilding team until they can do it in a full season. I mean, you look at this roster, it doesn't compare to some of the other playoff teams we've seen, so I just need to see more from them before I can actually believe in this. And if you're a Marlins fan that takes offense to that, please look at the farm system. Hardly any of your top prospects have came up for any sort of good sample size, and in the next couple seasons, they are going to come up, and they're going to be very effective, because this is the third-ranked farm system in all of baseball. This is a very deep farm system. Look at all those guys that are in the MLB as of right now. In 2020, Sixto came up. Jazz Chisholm came up. Monte Harrison came up. I believe Edward Cabrera also came up. Lewin Diaz came up. 
The farm system's here. They're ready to perform. They just need a little bit more time to develop and execute it at the major league level, but the Marlins are going to be scary. And while I don't know if they have enough to make a World Series run just on what they have right now, between the Braves, the Mets, and the Marlins over the next couple of years, the NL East is going to be an absolute dogfight right to the end of the season. It's going to be really exciting baseball to watch. I just really like a farm system like this. It's a lot of super athletic guys with a high ceiling. They could be busts, but they could also be potential all-stars. J.J. Blade, he's their second overall prospect. He's going to be a huge bat for them in the next couple seasons. And they just picked Max Meyer in 2020's draft, and he's already at the top of their farm system. So the way they've been drafting and the trades they've been making have really set them up nicely for where they are right now. As for the regular season, the Marlins started off a bit shaky, coming down with the first COVID cases of the season, missing a ton of games. Those two news article titles are kind of funny together. But then the Marlins kind of picked it up, and they just really never stopped performing well. At least they were winning games. They weren't exactly the best performers, but they just found ways to stay at the top of the division. And a huge part of that's Brian Anderson. He's relatively unknown in the scope of the MLB, mainly because his name's Brian Anderson, but he's been up for a few years going into his fourth season in 2021. I don't think he's going to win any MVPs in our lifetime, but look at these stats. I mean, people should know who he is. A top 100 player kind of means a lot more in the MLB because there's just so many guys, but he's certainly deserving of it as exit velos have been in the top 100 of the league in 2018 and 2019. But as of right now, this is the Marlins star player on offense at least. He's above league average in OPS, he has an OPS plus of 112, and his on-base percentage is 350. He made one of the best plays I've seen at third base in a few years, and if that's any indication of just who he is, he's just a solid player. A solid player who's going to take them into the teeth of this rebuild and really take them to the next level. But I really want to hit home how this team was just really lucky in the 60-game format. Look at these team stats. I was going to put up individual stats, but every stat I'd come across was like super average. Outside of the run differential, which was negative 48, and they were 24th in the league, not exactly what you'd think out of a playoff team that finished second in the NL East. But when it came to offense, every single stat was like between the 12 and 18th rank in MLB, and then for pitching, they'd be in like the 20 through 30 range in every category. There was no like outliers. They weren't like super good at striking people out, but they'd give up a lot of homers. They were just super average at everything. But the way they played was anything but average. They'd go out and get beat by like 10 runs one night, and then the next night they'd come back and win by like a one-run sack fly in the ninth or something like that. Just a real grinded-out team that just made other teams really frustrated playing them. They didn't really overpower any teams. They didn't really outpitch other teams. Outside of six, those good first half of the season, I mean, they just would win by like one run one night, and then they'd go out and get blown out by like 10 runs the next night. Very inconsistent play, but... It got them to the playoffs, they won a playoff series, and to be honest, the bottom feeder's mindset was really fun to watch, because, I mean, no one expected the Marlins to be good, so, like, we were all Dennis Eckersley calling them bottom feeders, but they proved us wrong, and whether or not that'll happen again next year remains to be seen yet, but we'll see. And we saved the best for last, talking about the first place Braves, who finished 35-25, and 25, eliminated by the Dodgers in the NLCS. Max Fried was the war leader with a 2.9 war, super impressive season. The biggest surprise was the entire pitching staff. We kind of all thought that they were screwed with pitching. Like, Cole Hamels was found out to be injured, and then Fulty wasn't pitching good, and Mike Soroka wasn't on the rotation because he was hurt, and everyone just thought the Braves would maybe even miss the playoffs because they didn't have good pitching. They did an incredible job filling the void, calling up prospects, and turning guys who were long relief guys into starters, and just making the most out of their situation. They killed it. To free agency, they are losing reliever Mark Melanson, Cole Hamels, who never threw an inning as a Brave, Ozuna, who turned out to be a great pickup for them last offseason, Shane Green, one of the bullpen arms, and Nick Markakis, who's been around for a long time. These are kind of significant losses, but I don't think they're going to hurt them in that drastic of a way. Cole Hamels, like I said, didn't throw any innings. Mark Melanson was really effective out of the bullpen, but this bullpen proved that it was capable and could do it with more than just one guy. Same thing in Shane Green's case. He's a good reliever, but they have other good relievers, and they can always sign more of them. Ozuna might be a bit of a loss for them because he was putting up MVP-type numbers in 2020, and Nick Markakis has been a cornerstone of their outfield for almost a decade now, I think. And if you look at a guy who's had a quietly just great career, Nick Markakis is the guy. Just go look at his baseball reference page. I mean, he's been around for a long time, 
but he's put together these really solid seasons that they don't necessarily give him a Hall of Fame case, but you'll look back on his stats and, and realize he was one of the most consistent players of our era. But like I said, I think they can recover from these losses. A huge part of that's his farm system, which is ranked fifth in baseball. And that's really impressive because the Braves have been a good team for the better part of probably half a decade now. They haven't been getting those high round draft picks, but it hasn't mattered as the Braves have a good balance of good pitchers and good position players coming up. The two notable players who came up in 2020 are Ian Anderson and Christian Pache. Pache is already one of the best defensive center fielders in all of baseball. His offense just needs to get there a little bit. Hopefully more MLB at-bats get him there. And Ian Anderson was insane in his short time at the major league level this year. He's a huge reason this pitching staff made such a bounce back after all the losses and injuries. I'd say the 2020 regular season went better than Braves fans expected. They made it all the way to the NLCS and got eliminated by the Dodgers in a heartbreaking Game 7 loss after they were leading the series 3-1, to but... We won't talk about it. On the bright side, Freddie Freeman finally got his MVP award. And this is nothing new for him, but look at those offensive categories that he was top three in. You'd be hard-pressed to find more than a couple that he wasn't in the top three in. And they almost went MVP and Cy Young on the same team. Max Fried had like one shaky start at the end of the year, but look at his development over his career. His first two seasons in the league were pretty decent considering he had such a small sample size, but a 128 ERA+, plus, a 332 ERA, and this was kind of inconsistent coming out of the bullpen. Then if we look at 2019, he was flipping between bullpen and rotation more often, and I think this really affected his overall numbers for the season. He couldn't really get comfortable. A 4.02 ERA, 115 ERA+, plus. but I think the stat most heavily affected by his lack of comfortability was the hits per nine. It's hard for a guy not used to coming out of the bullpen to come in in the middle of a game. Maybe there's runners on base, who knows, but he's going to give up more hits in that type of situation. But then in 2020, it all came together. A 2.25 ERA, a 2.12 ERA+, plus, hits lowest in his career. His whip was right around the 1.0 mark. Great season for Max Fried. And it's the type of season that some people saw coming out of this guy. He just had all the attributes. He just wasn't given the right opportunities to work and do what he wants to do. It's a shame he got beat out by Bauer for Cy Young this year, but I think his name's going to get thrown around in that voting for a long time to come. As for the Braves as a whole, I think the next few years are going to be very important for them. If they don't win a World Series, this is going to be a big waste of talent and a big waste of a decade. But I genuinely believe that they can get it done. There's too much talent on this team to just lay over and die to the Dodgers every season. The Nationals did what they did in 2019. Why can't the Braves do the same? And to wrap up here, I just wanted to do my prediction for what I think the NL East will shake up to be at the end of 2021. Starting with the Phillies in fifth, it's going to be chaos, and they need a year to figure it out. It's not going to be a fun year. In fourth, I have Miami, because I think 2020 was a fluke, and that they need another year or so to figure it out. In third, I have the Nationals. I think they're going to make at least one more big move before free agency's over. They got Josh Bell in a trade the other day. While I don't think that's enough to put them over the top, it's certainly a step in the right direction. The Nationals are the biggest wild card in this division. They have the potential to finish fifth, or they have the potential to finish first. Who really knows? As runner-up, I have the Mets. I think they're going to make at least one big move, like a Bauer signing, maybe a George Springer signing. That's going to put them over the other teams in this division. And I think it puts them in the same category as the Braves, who I think will finish first over the Mets. Depending on the moves the Mets make, this could be a toss-up for first or second, but I think the Braves are the most primed to take the division again this year. But if you're still here at the end of this like 25 minute long video, I really appreciate you. Thank you for watching. I would encourage you to hit subscribe and even like or comment if you have a video idea. Follow on Twitter to stay the most up to date with the channel. But I hope everyone had a good holiday. Thank you guys. Have a good one.